Straight ahead on Entrepreneur, we sit down with the woman who created the hit series, Fifty Shades of Grey. And I thought, I'll continue doing my job in telly and this will happen. And then, you know, it's just, you know, I'm now here doing this. And it, it's, it's been an extraordinary journey. I've learned a huge amount. What it took to turn her idea into a worldwide multimedia success. Plus, meet Bravo reality star and power real estate broker, Frederick Eklund. And she's the expert on happiness. With her books and podcasts, Gretchen Rubin will talk about how to break out of the rut and get back to being happy. Those stories plus, did you know that certain zodiac signs make for better entrepreneurs? Find out where you fall. Entrepreneur starts right now. I'm Lance Smith. Welcome to Entrepreneur, a show based on the popular magazine and website. It's long been said that nothing is black or white on an entrepreneurial journey. It's a continuum of shades of gray. So it only makes sense that a book series based on a billionaire businessman is aptly titled Fifty Shades of Gray. And the woman who created Christian Gray in the wildly popular trilogy had an unorthodox journey to success. Do you think you're the first woman to try to save him? He's changing. It's not what he wants anymore, but it's what he needs. Looking so crazy in love. Got me looking, got me looking so crazy in love. It's the book trilogy turned movie franchise that has earned hundreds of millions of dollars worldwide and is responsible for not only a boom in the bondage industry, but a baby boom as well. Unless you're a serious bookworm, you may not realize that the Fifty Shades of Grey series actually started as Twilight fan fiction. I know what you are. Your skin is pale white and ice cold. You don't go out into the sunlight. Say it out loud. Say it. Vampire. Are you afraid? No. E.L. James posted Master of the Universe, her original title for Fifty Shades, on fanfiction.net under the pen name Snow Queen's Ice Dragon in 2009. And she had no idea what the next chapter had in store for her, as our correspondent Scott Carty found out. You have quite an entrepreneurial success story. You sat down, you, you put pen to paper and started writing these stories. Talk about that. Did you ever dream it would get to this point? No, absolutely not. I had a, when I started writing this story, I wrote them for myself. And um, as, the, as we all know, it started as Twilight fan fiction. They became so popular mm -hmm. that I got very concerned that someone would copy the idea. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll publish it. And I came up with a pen name and I thought I'll continue doing my job in telly and this will happen. And then, you know, it's just, you know, I'm now here doing this and it, it's it's been an extraordinary journey i've learned a huge amount um in the in the entire process and now i feel a bit like christian gray with okay, well, should we do this should we do this should we do this it's and strange projects coming across my desk and it's 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 been a blast if something were to happen to you i could never forgive myself Oh, 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 no, no. Despite its fair share of critics, the Fifty Shades of Grey books and movies have catapulted E.L. James to the top of the earnings heap. According to Vintage Books, more than 100 million copies of the series have sold worldwide, 45 million in the U.S. In 2013, she was the highest paid author in the world, raking in $95 million. And her total earnings over the past four years is estimated to be a whopping $131 million. Speaking of authors, long before Stephen King sold 350 million plus books, he was a budding entrepreneur. To help pay his college tuition, student Stephen created a sole proprietor startup with an entrepreneurial price structure. He drafted term papers for other students, charging $20 for an A, 10 bucks for a B, and he wouldn't collect charges for papers that only earned a C. However, the most enterprising aspect of this business model, King actually paid his customers $20 for papers that earned less than a C. 
King is used to cranking out literary works, having dozens of novels, hundreds of short stories, and a few non-fiction books under his belt. So how does he unleash his creative beast so consistently? King says he sets daily quotas for himself, about 10 pages a day, which equals about 2,000 words seven days a week, even holidays. So if you're serious about your craft, start by setting a daily quota to meet, and you could be the next Stephen King of your field. Now to the next generation of entrepreneurs and the young actress, recording artist, dancer, and cover girl who is making a big mark in the business world. Zendaya was a Disney darling as a tween, but is changing the game as a young adult with the dual launch of her clothing line and app. Daya by Zendaya is the first ever direct-to-consumer celebrity fashion line with the power of an e-commerce website. The women's collection celebrates gender fluidity and elegant androgyny with unisex pieces for all body types, with sizes ranging from 0 to 22. And while she launched in a few pop-up stores, the direct-to-consumer platform allows Zendaya to provide high-quality pieces at affordable prices. I'm a Virgo, so I'm very like detail-oriented and a little bit like OCD. So everything is like, I need this longer, I need this shorter, I need this this, I need this this, and that. Um, I think that kind of creates really great great pieces because you put in the effort and the, and the time and oh, can I, we get this in this fabric and this texture and what if we got rid of this and what if we add this and when there's a whole bunch of people creating this together and it's a good flow, you get good stuff out of it. And launched alongside her clothing line is Zendaya the app, which gives fans a portal into her day-to-day -day life and even allows them to send her personal videos. Zendaya, who's made headlines blasting racist and sexist trolls on social media, says the app is a safe space for her followers, featuring only positive conversations and comments. Well, Sarah Michelle Geller is helping usher in the next generation's answer to Pillsbury, Betty Crocker, and Duncan Hines. The award-winning actress co-founded Foodsters DIY and organic baking kits delivered to your door. Sarah and her partners recognized that Baking was a billion dollar industry that hadn't been modernized. So Foodsters combined subscription commerce, new media, and natural foods to deliver baking kits and mixes in stores and online. And despite what you may think, Sarah says her celebrity worked against her. She says it may have helped open some doors, but she realized the novelty of seeing Buffy baking would wear off. So she put in some serious OT to get her idea to be taken seriously. Sarah says her ultimate goal is simple help families create sweet memories together in the kitchen. He caters to millionaires and billionaires and is known around the world for his hit Bravo show, Million Dollar Listing. For entrepreneur and real estate power broker, Frederick Eklund, selling apartments in the tens of millions of dollars, just part of the job. Entrepreneur digital editorial director, Dan Boba stopped by Eklund's office to chat about what it takes to succeed and how he's always looking to go bigger. What are some of your secrets? You're obviously incredibly successful. How do you know when to push someone? How do you know when to back off? How do you know when to say this guy's never going to buy anything and, and cut bait with them? Um, I, uh, the boring answer uh, is I have to work really hard, right? And you have to kind of also treat everybody with the same respect. I try to at least. You know, New York is interesting because I never know who has the money. I mean, you look like you have a lot of money, but I could be wrong. Uh, and then there's like a kid in shorts coming in with a surfboard on his shoulder and you think he has no money, but he has just sold his, you know, company in California and his tech company for two billion. What do I know? Right. You have, and also some people that I worked with 10 years ago that got a rental in Jersey uh, for $2,000, then made their fortune 10 years later and remember me. So it's good. I think it's important to treat everybody the same right. way. Now, um, I think also I try to, hopefully you can see, I try to be, a, you know, be me. I'm what is give give, of, give a visual demonstration of you? No, no, no. I'm, what I'm saying is like I'm selling real estate, and it's a very high pressured world of like 25 million dollars or 50 million in your case. But if I took it too seriously and took took become so pressured of all this, I wouldn't be fun to be with. Right, I, right, I think, right. Because you're asking me what are my successes. I think I think part of it, hopefully, is that my job is of course to guide you to the $50 million apartment, but it's also for you to have fun. Right, it's right, right. It's a fun experience. Okay. And nobody wants to work with somebody who's not fun. It's right, scary. Right, so right. So I try, that's why I mean, I try to be me and I try to, you know, entertain and just be authentically, you know, Frederick. Are there days, you must have days where you wake up and you're just like, oh, I don't feel like 
showing this place again or I don't feel like doing this or does that or do you not experience that but if you do how do you kind of motivate yourself and get yourself to do it no I think for me it maybe connects a little bit to what we started like I'm not I, I'm not from here and I feel like I had to fight not not with anybody but in here to get here I feel yeah like I have I put sacrifice a lot to get to New York and I was so in love always been so in love with New York I'm the biggest love story of my life and I have an obsession with the city and the energy and you know I used to come here as a kid and I just looked out on the buildings and the neon and the people and the taxis and I just I want to live here so now when I'm here I, I don't feel like oh my god I need to go show some 20 million dollars apartment that's so boring I, I'm if anything I have such a high that I'm here and I can actually do what I do it's amazing yeah and then to like advise these developers to what they should build I did right. it in this part in this building because I came on after it was designed but in other buildings, I'm part of the team very early on, and I actually changed the skyline. I mean, literally, like decide what is going to be built and right. what it look like on the outside. Into, in, that's really, really exciting to me. Yeah. So, what motivates me, I think, is New York and really be creative. Right. And not only show apartments, and then they sh doing things like this, and hopefully yeah. someone's watching. That adds a little bit of a layer of glamour to the process. Well, that's awesome. To check out more of Dan's interview with Frederick, go to entrepreneur.com. All creatures need a, a shortcut because we don't have time to reevaluate the safety of everything. So if you take uh, a mouse and put it on the middle of the floor in the light, it will run away. It won't say, oh, I'm in a Disney movie, this is great. It will just run away right. because it's uncomfortable there, because it's unsafe there. And so in order to succeed, organisms, particularly humans, have to build a comfort zone that matches the safety zone. Straight ahead, we talk with best-selling author and marketing guru, Seth Godin. And later, we meet the woman who walked away from a $100,000 Shark Tank offer. And lessons you can learn from country music artists in entrepreneurship. We'll be right back. To celebrate the franchising community, we've created our Entrepreneur Franchise 500 segment series sponsored by Organiche Boosters. Kids, trampolines, fun, and money. Sounds like a good combination, right? The hottest trend for family entertainment is indoor trampoline parks, and one of the fastest growing is urban air. They're opening up 70 new locations this year across the U.S. and a few internationally as well. The parks offer a variety of trampoline activities from wall-to-wall -wall trampolines, foam pit, trampoline dodgeball, trampoline runway, slam dunk track, and the trampoline bowl. Their corporate team will help you find the right space, help with HR and staffing, accounting, inventory, insurance, and other business functions to get you up and running. For more franchise information, go to urbanairtrampolinepark.com. As part of our Entrepreneur Franchise 500 series, we honor the vendors to franchisers. One of these supplier companies we are honoring is the company behind Pucker Powder Candy Business. Creative Concepts, the founders of Pucker Powder, was founded in 1997 by Scott Green. They design interactive candy dispensing systems as well as develop top-notch flavors and candies. So it started in 1997, very small little space, we were building and designing custom sand dispensing machines. Sounds kind of weird, but it's for sand art, basically to fill up little bottles with layers of sand. We ended up taking that concept, and so we decided to design some dispensers for that. We started with candy, make your own candy tube. Pucker powder is the name. We currently produce pucker powder, pucker powder bits, and flavor mints. Pucker powder is powder, the other two are a small ball type mint almost, but in different and unique flavors. Pucker powder, we make it in our facility here, and we also have a manufacturing facility in France for our EU customers. The pucker powder line, however, is a blended powdered candy in multiple flavors and colors. We've got about 20 flavors, we rotate some in and out, but it's a pretty simple process that's a, a mixing of powder, 
of, in the color and the flavor. We add some sour in there. We have some super sour to really spice it up some. Pucker powder bits. It's a ball and we do it in what's called a panning operation. Very traditional type of candy manufacturing. We're taking a ball and we're actually increasing a ball with powder and a syrup and we add just like pucker powder, although it's solid, it's a little ball, uh, but it's got a nice crunch to it. We have all kinds of unique flavors. We've got a peppermint, we've got a lime chipotle, we've got blueberry, we've got watermelon. We've got about 20 flavors of that right now, working on a really good coffee as well. Best-selling author Seth Godin knows how to market, whether it's launching successful businesses for himself or writing books like Purple Cow or All Marketers Are Liars. Godin has become an important voice on how entrepreneurs can achieve success. Behind the brand creator and host Brian Elliott talks with Godin about the importance of understanding your customers and realizing when it's time to test a business idea. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with author, entrepreneur, thought leader Seth Godin. Seth, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. Uh, talk to me about the comfort zone, because you mentioned this in the book a lot, and I thought it was a great distinction um, of the safety zone and the comfort zone. Talk sure. about that a little bit. So all creatures need a, a shortcut, because we don't have time to reevaluate the safety of everything. So if you take uh, a mouse and put it in the middle of the floor in the light, it will run away. It won't say, oh, I'm in a Disney movie, this is great. It will just run away, right. because it's un comfortable there because it's unsafe there. And so in order to succeed, organisms, particularly humans, have to build a comfort zone that matches the safety zone. So they don't have to worry about whether it's safe, they just worry about if it's comfortable. Because if it's comfortable, they're fine. If it's not comfortable, they run away. And I came to this uh, realization because I was talking to a friend, really talented, and she was looking for a job. And I brainstormed 20 different things that she could do to get on the radar of the places that deserved her. And she said, you know, Seth, that's not really in my comfort zone. Because the last time she looked for a job was 25 years ago, and there was a method. So in her mind, comfort and safe were the same thing. Gotcha. What I said to her is, you know what? Your comfort zone isn't working, because you only want to do things that feel safe, and they're not safe. They're dangerous. They're going to leave you unemployed. Yeah. You're going to have to do this other stuff that feels uncomfortable, but is actually safe. So the safest thing you can do is take a risk or what feels like a risk. And the riskiest thing you can do is play it safe. That it used to be, you know, 10,000 people went to Ford Motor Company one day to do their job like they did the day before. And they all got fired on the same day because they had played it safe, they thought. But what they had really done is played it comfortable. It wasn't their fault they got fired. It was the idiot bosses who made ugly cars that screwed up, but they got fired. What would have happened in 1987 if the UAW had gone on strike, not for more wages, but to insist that Ford make better looking, better designed cars. Think about how that would have completely changed the course of automotive history and saved the jobs of all of those people. Right. But that wasn't the mindset. That didn't feel comfortable, so they didn't do it. So the message is, if you're standing still, the world is moving, you're actually losing ground. Yeah, and if yeah. you're not, you know, there's two kinds of labor. There's physical labor, which we did for a really long time, and then there's emotional labor. And that's what most of us get paid for. Right? If you don't have calluses on your hands and you don't have dirt on your jeans, you're getting paid for emotional labor. And instead of hiding from it, I think we need to embrace it. If what you did today wasn't hard, then you probably didn't create enough value because you probably didn't expose yourself to enough risk and fear. Because that's what we're paid for. We're not paid to fill in TPS reports because we don't need those anymore. That if you have a job where someone is telling you exactly what to do, they can find someone cheaper than you to do it. To check out more of Brian's interview, go to entrepreneur.com. Are you happy? That's the question many of us ask ourselves sometimes on a daily basis. Whether you're an entrepreneur or in a corporate job, we all want to be happy, especially at work. Gretchen Rubin is the host of the wildly popular podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin, as well as several books on happiness and millions of followers online. Entrepreneur contributor Kelsey Humphrey sat down with Ruben to talk about the small steps we can do right now to head towards happiness. People who are watching, I can, I know that some people are going to be like, well, what about spontaneity? And yeah. like, you know, this yeah. sounds so rigid. What do yeah. you say to them? Well, that's very interesting. And that was another thing when I was coming up with the four tendencies. One of the things, like, because it took me a really long time to understand the four, the four, the four different categories. And people would always talk about spontaneity, and I'm like, and finally I was like, well, you know, spontaneity is not a high value to me. I don't value spontaneity. 
Mm. I don't even really like spontaneity. <laughs> um, but so that's okay, because now that I know that about myself, I don't worry about mm -hmm. making time to be spontaneous. But for some people, especially for rebels, mm -hmm. if you really value spontaneity, it's a very big sign that you might be a rebel. So maybe you want a freelance career where you're always deciding how much you want to work and what kind of gigs you want to take. Um, that would be very upsetting to me. I don't like that. I would, that would be too much ambiguity and uncertainty, mm -hmm. but some people thrive on that. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like, how do you feel about spontaneity? It's not necessarily something that everybody likes. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. If you really do like it, think about, well, how can, or somebody was saying how she used to have a job where she went into an office every day and she hated it, but then she got, she went to work for a restaurant chain um, where it was like every day she would go to like a different a different restaurant and kind of check in and like mm. so there was a lot of travel and like well today I feel like doing this today I feel like doing that I don't feel like being on the road today oh today I feel like listening to a podcast for a couple of, you know she could she could do her job but in a way that accommodated the way she liked to work so I think mm. a lot of her, it's back to this idea of self knowledge yeah. that you said right at the beginning think about well what where do you thrive what kind of and maybe you can't shape everything to suit everything about you. Like maybe yeah. you're a night person and you would really prefer to start your day at 10.30. Yeah, you can. Right. Some offices can accommodate that, some can't, um, but you can at least think about it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you could say to your boss, is there any way we could, we have this really important staff meeting every week. Is there any way we could move it from 8.30 to 10.30? That would really help me out. Maybe they could do that. They can't mm -hmm. start the work day at 10.30. Right. Maybe the staff meeting could move later or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Once you know yourself, you can start thinking about like, well, how could I, how could I set things up like yeah. to create the environment that works for me. Fascinating. So one thing I think that people who are maybe writers are trying to get more creative, one thing with you is like a blog post a day, yeah. a podcast a week, multiple books, like I'm overwhelmed just thinking about it. And I'm also like trying to, I mean, it's yeah. a lot of content. I understand the struggle. So I think there's two facets that I'd like you to talk about, and that is coming up with ideas mm. or creativity mm -hmm. and then research. I mean, you do so much research. Yeah. What's your process for those two things? Well, and there, absolutely intertwined. I mean, okay. you can't, I can't talk about one without the other because um, really the way that I get ideas is it, it, just by taking in information. Mm -hmm. And so I will, um, like I will often be, like I read a lot of stuff that's weird. You know, like I go to the library <laughs> all the time. I order all these obscure books off Amazon. Um, and so I will often become like interested in a subject and do a lot of research on it kind of for no reason or sometimes it does, I don't understand the reason until much later. So for right now, I'm obsessed with the sense of smell, I'm obsessed with mm. color, um, I have all these books about color all over. Mm -hmm. um, there was a period where I was really interested in pain, um, then I'll get really interested in like a person, like I was like super, super fascinated with Thomas Merton who <laughs> nobody really remembers anymore but he was a really big deal at the time. Um, and, and I kind of, I used to try to be much more uh, kind of strategic about it and now I realize I should just let myself do whatever I want and that it's by just taking in all this information that that's when I get my ideas, like I start noticing patterns or even just talking to people. Mm -hmm. Like with the four tendencies, one thing that really struck me is there was this group of people that whenever I said, how do you feel about New Year's resolutions? They would say, well, I would never keep a New Year's resolution because our January 1st is an arbitrary date and I thought, the arbitrariness of January 1st does not bother me, but all these people are picking up on this. So there's like a pattern there that I wanted to explain. And reading just lets you like mm. go through all these sort of patterns much more easily. To read and hear more about Gretchen's story, go to Kelsey's website, thepursuit.tv or entrepreneur.com. The long-running ABC show The Bachelor is making some moves in the marketing department. Would you believe a bachelor wine? We'll have that story. Plus, we sit down with the founder of Kind Bars, a huge success for his company, but also for communities across the nation. Entrepreneur will be right back. The Bachelor is one of the longest running reality TV shows in history, and it's had its fair share of participants cross over to celebrity status. But now the show's biggest star across all seasons is making its way to your living room. We're talking about the wine. Yep, Bachelor Nation can now sip official Bachelor wines. Co-founder of Wines That Rock, Howard Jackowitz, says the goal was to capture the excitement and spontaneity of the show and the incredible passion the viewers have for it. 
The collection, launched in tandem with Season 21, is comprised of three wines blended by award-winning winemakers from California's premium Central Coast and Central Valley. They include the Fantasy Suite, a Cabernet Sauvignon, the One-on-One, -on -one, a Chardonnay, and the Final Rosé. But if wine isn't your thing, two rockers are taking a shot at a first-of-its-kind drink. Maroon 5's Adam Levine and Van Halen's Sammy Hagar are launching Santo Mezquila. It blends the processes and flavors of tequila with its lesser-known Mexican cousin, Mezcal, representing the first quality blend of different agave distillates to hit the market. The collaboration came about when the fellows were offered Mezcal in Cabo. They both found the smoky taste overpowering, so they mixed it with their tequila and the light bulb went off. Hagar approached the Mexican distillery he worked with to make Cabo Wabo Tequila, a brand he founded in 1996. And after several experimental blends, they arrived at a taste that pleased them both. Kind Healthy Snacks has sold more than one billion snack bars. That's billion with a B. The New York City-based company was founded in 2004 by CEO Daniel Levetsky and today has about 300 full-time employees. The social mission component of the company has inspired more than one million acts of kindness. This story, brought to you by Staples, profiles just how much Lubetsky has learned over the past two decades of running companies and what it means to run a business that is both profitable and gives back to the community. We faced the possibility of having to close down our doors because overnight we lost about a million dollars in sales that we had worked so hard to build. I'm Daniel Lubetsky, the CEO and founder of Kind, which is a company that makes healthy snacks. At the very beginning of our journey, even at the inception of Kind, we faced one of our biggest challenges. Prior to launching our own brand, we were importing a brand of Fruit Nut Bars, and the manufacturer that we were buying them from changed the ingredients to add sulfur dioxide and sorbitol and other artificial ingredients. It was a very big problem because our whole premise of the way we were marketing the products here and what was important to us it was that it was made with natural ingredients. We advised these retailers like Whole Foods that our product suddenly was going to contain sulfur dioxide. Companies wouldn't carry those products anymore. So overnight we lost over a million dollars in sales that we had like killed ourselves to get to. It was very daunting for us to face that situation, decide to have what it takes to try to rebuild everything from scratch. That's when we decided to create Kind. We were very scared. We were uncertain about whether we we're going to be able to pull it off and if we had enough time to pull it off. And so we worked 24-7. Looking back, it was awesome that we had the fortitude to, to just do it on our own and control our destiny in the future. Today, Kind is one of the fastest growing healthy snack companies in the US. We've sold over a, a billion Kind bars. One of the lessons uh, for all entrepreneurs is don't give up too quickly or too easily because sometimes it's right around the corner. If you work hard enough, you're gonna break through those walls and then just have an incredible opportunity. Some great advice. Staples is celebrating small businesses and entrepreneurs just like Daniel that have overcome obstacles and found success. For more stories like this, go to entrepreneur.com. Okay, so I can't stop looking at this pizza crust. It looks so delicious and the packaging is just perfect. So tell me a little bit more about Rustic Crust and the origins of the company. Well, Rustic Crust was actually founded by Russ Sterl, who wanted to have a traditional but much healthier version of pizza innovations. Okay, so when I order pizza from just a normal pizza place, the toppings are kind of same old, same old, boring, nothing exciting. But it looks like Organizza has a lot of options available. Yes, we have a number of healthy options available for our consumers. Things like jalapeno crushed peppers, habanero, and chipotle crushed as well. Okay, so it looks like we got everything we need. We got the crust, we got the sauce, we got the toppings. Do you have any tips on how to make the best pizza? Yes, we will actually be showing our audience how to make the best pizza possible in our very own kitchen. So I'm gonna show you guys how to make a pizza, real simple. I'm gonna use rustic crust dough. I'm gonna use rustic crust sauce. I'm gonna use some standard ingredients and then I'm gonna to top it off with organizza. And we might even use an organizza sauce or two. First thing that we need is the dough. That's the base layer. Rustic crust brand, of course. Next, we have the sauce. Spread it around. And uh, while I'm doing this, I'm uh, leaving myself a little bit of room 
um, towards the edge, and that's actually gonna be what we consider the crust. Next layer, cheese. Next, we're gonna do some toppings. Everybody's favorite, pepperoni. Now we're gonna go with another common twist, a little bit of pineapple. Now, that's good for ingredients. What I'm gonna do though is I'm gonna add a little bit of spinach into this one because I like a nice healthy dose of greens. We're gonna put it in the oven for about 15, 10, 15 minutes at about 400 degrees. We're gonna jazz this pizza up with some peppers. You've all seen crushed red peppers. I'm gonna use some Organizza brand crushed jalapeno. All right, careful not to rub your eye after this. These guys are ready to go. They look delicious. One more thing though, I think that I would like some dipping sauce for these. So. I'm gonna take this Organizza brand sriracha sauce mix. Very, very simple. Just a slight bit of powder there. All right. A little bit of water. And there we have it, sriracha dipping sauce, instantly made. I'm Micah Bowser, I'm a food scientist with Serenata Brands, and this has been a Quick Pizza. So thanks for joining. Looking forward to connecting with you on Organizza soon. Straight ahead, entrepreneur lessons you can learn from your favorite country stars, and the woman who took her product to Shark Tank and walked away from a $100,000 deal We'll tell you why and what you can learn when Entrepreneur comes right back. All entrepreneurs know how hard it is to take a big risk to pursue an even bigger dream. But you can take some inspiration from these country entrepreneurs who prove that no matter the adversity, there's always a way to make your voice heard. Full of broken thoughts I cannot repair The man in black was the quintessential country star of the 20th century thanks to his booming yet brooding Old Testament baritone. But after 25 years of successful country and pop hits and a long battle with addiction, Johnny Cash's long streak of success ended with his relationship with Columbia Records in the mid-80s. Many labeled him washed up. That is until the early 90s when he staged a comeback by guest starring on a U2 track and releasing a wildly acclaimed album produced by producer Rick Rubin for his label. Lesson learned, perseverance pays off. Don't be too proud to change lanes in order to succeed. Our lives are better left to chance. I could have missed the pain. But I'd have had to miss the day. Garth Brooks may have friends in low places, but his earnings are high, real high. He was country music's highest paid performer in 2015, netting over 90 million while on tour, and he's racked up another 70 million cents. How did this country music entrepreneur do it? by marrying his desire to strike out on his own while being true to his roots. Raised in a family of country western singers, Brooks focused on sports in college and dabbled in rock music after graduation. But it didn't take Brooks long to realize his true calling lay with country, catapulting the singer to superstardom. Lesson learned, while it's okay to take the road less traveled, don't deny your natural talents just for the sake of being different. If I were a boy Nearly every successful contemporary female country singer calls Reba McIntyre her role model. Reba says the secret to success in anything is to have a big heart and the courage to go wherever it leads you, even if that takes you out of your comfort zone and into risky territory. Lesson learned, making mistakes is a big part of being an entrepreneur, so keep taking risks. After all, can you really appreciate standing up if you never fall down? If you're an entrepreneur, we've all dreamed about what it would be like to be on Shark Tank. For Lisa Bendero, that was a reality, except she was one of the few that turned down an offer, $100,000. Entrepreneur contributor Jessica Abo sat down with Bendero to talk Shark Tank and what it takes to grow an idea. 
speaking of all things fashion, I am with fashion designer and entrepreneur Lisa Bindero, who started Nice Pipes. It's so nice to be sitting down with you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. So tell me a little bit about how Nice Pipes started. I was actually walking to the studio downtown to teach my class and I was freezing cold in my cropped yoga pants. You know when you have that like space yes. between your sneakers <laughs> yes. and your pants or your boots? And I just like knew there was, no, it was October. There was no way that I was gonna make it through the winter. So I went on search for leg warmers and all I could find were those old school, like acrylic knit sweater material leg warmers. It just shocked me that this product hadn't been updated in so much time. So I designed for myself to use uh, leg warmers and arm warmers that are made from the same stretchy fabric as yoga pants or workout pants. Uh, I started wearing them to teach my classes and all the other teachers and students were like, I want a pair, I want a pair. And that's sort of how Nice Vibes began. So what advice do you have for people once they have an idea? So the first step I, for me was like learning the language and the world of uh, fashion and retail. It wasn't my background at all, so I had to learn. So anyone who I think is looking to start a business, whether it's like an e-commerce business or a app, developing an app, it's really learning the language and the nuts and bolts of that business first so that you can then take your idea and take that knowledge and kind of integrate them together. I love that. Now, your business idea actually landed you on Shark Tank. Tell us a little bit about your experience. In all my preparation for the show, I really was hoping to do a deal with Lori or Barbara. So I was looking to have a mentor, someone to help me grow Nice Pipes. Ultimately, what happened that day, Barbara had asked for 40% of my business, and I just felt like, like if I was gonna give away 40% of my business, Yes, amazing things were gonna happen with her guidance, but it just felt like the company would no longer be mine. And the progress that I had made to date felt all of a sudden felt really good. And I didn't really need more than that to keep growing. If someone is in that place where money's on the table and they don't know what they should do from there, what advice do you have about that? Be really clear on what your goals are. The end goal isn't always bigger, bigger, bigger business. Sometimes there's more to the story knowing yourself and being introspective and taking the time to think about what you want will help you make the right decision in that moment. To learn more about Nice Pipes, you can go right here. And to learn more about me, you can go to Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Snapchat, and YouTube. And to work with Caravan Stylist Studio, you can go right here. We'll see you next time. What's your zodiac sign? Depending on what you say, you could have better qualities to be an entrepreneur or not. We'll have the list. Entrepreneur will be right back. There are plenty of entrepreneurs building companies to help people from getting conned. From identity theft to scams, you can never be too careful. In today's con job, we take a look at F-Secure. We start off with what is important to all of us, being safe when we use our computers out in public. While in the coffee shop, restaurant, or on the train, we need to be aware that there are people out there looking to steal your identity and personal information. F-Secure has been protecting millions of computers around the globe for over 25 years, from the first malware to the latest targeted attack. With tens of millions of consumer customers and over 100,000 corporate customers around the world, F-Secure has offices in many countries worldwide. You might think that you have nothing to hide, but the fact is that you have everything to protect. There are people online who know who you are and who know what you're doing online. The worst case scenario is that a user becomes a victim of harassment or stalking or threats or any of the possible bad things that might happen because bad people out there know too much about you. The way to maintain your anonymity online is to use encryption. Encryption works. And there's multiple different ways you can implement encryption for your network traffic. But by far easiest is by using a VPN. A VPN like our Freedom. Going online without a VPN is like walking downtown wearing a shirt with your name and home address printed on the front and your browser history printed on the back of it. Unless you protect yourself, you lose parts of yourself every time you go online. You lose bits and pieces of your personal information. 
And it's up to you to fight this. It's up to you to protect yourself and to take control. Is entrepreneurial success written in the stars? Maybe, just maybe, entrepreneurs are born with it. While any zodiac sign can become a successful entrepreneur by tapping into unique skills, strengths, and abilities, there are a few zodiac signs that best exhibit the two major personality traits successful entrepreneurs most commonly possess, those who take action and exhibit resilience. According to the horoscope.org, those signs include Aries, those born between March 20th and April 19th, which include Hugh Hefner, Sarah Jessica Parker, Victoria Beckham, Kate Hudson, Sarah Michelle Geller, just to name a few. And Cancer, born between June 20th and July 22nd, which includes Richard Branson, Ariana Huffington, and Kevin Hart. Joined now by investment banker, attorney, and most importantly, creative critical thinker, Michael Fugler. How are you, sir? Great to be here. Let's talk business, and specifically, I talk uh, investments, and in this day and age, it's all about crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is in every magazine, it's on all entrepreneurs' lips, because it's something new. The real issue is, what's it all about for the investor, and what's it all about for the entrepreneur? Why don't we talk about both? For the, the investor, real quick, the question is, so now, for the first time, people that are not accredited investors, meaning most of America, has a chance to invest in anything that they want that's on a crowdfunding portal. So the question they have to say is, am I capable of deciding for myself? Can I do the due diligence or am I relying on someone else? And if I'm relying on someone else, who is it? And ask them if they're looking out for you. Mm -hmm. The second thing is it's like drilling oil. If you're gonna invest in one well, you're either going to hit a home run or you're going to be bust. Okay. Uh, invest across the board. Consider investing a few hundred dollars in several projects, like investing in several oil wells. In the oil business, they say, we hope one's a home run, one's a bust, two or three will be okay. Yeah. And I think the same thing on uh, startups. Uh, a lot of them are going to go out. They'll bust. So the chances of hitting one are going to be slim, so be careful. That's the investor side. Okay. On the entrepreneur side, it's great because it's the first time that you get to expose yourself to millions of people to tell the story that you have. But what you have to realize is there's some definite upfront cost. You have to be prepared to that. Do you have those costs? The second thing is when you're negotiating with these portals or an investment banking firm, or you prepare to offer and find people that will give you a little bit down and take the rest on a successful raise. Okay. We're dealing with people that want all their money up front. It's a great opportunity, there's significant upfront cost. It does give you a great deal of exposure, but there are a lot of risks and you wanna do your homework and it's best to get a good advisor because the rules are new and a lot of people don't understand them clearly. Sounds like you've got to do your homework on both sides. I think you do. It's not just throwing a little bit of money in a lot of places. Do your homework. You know, the investor needs to ask, how am I going to get my money back? Is this like a Kickstarter campaign where I really don't care, I just want to promote entrepreneurialism and I really like that company, or I really like that guy that's putting this project together, this product, and I hope he makes it and if he does, I'm going to, I'm going to make money. If not, that's okay, I want to give him a shot. Or is this like, geez, I've got this few thousand dollars yeah. and I have to invest it somewhere. It's the beginning process of my investments. Crowdfunding and startups are not the place for that type of investor to be. So you have to look at yourself, look in the mirror and say, can I afford to lose this money? Yeah. Do I know what I'm doing or am I better off trying to make it? You know, I had a conversation earlier about going to, the, to Vegas in a casino. You know, go out there, have fun. If you win a little money, take your money, put it back in your pocket, and play with the house's money. Same thing on this venture capital crowdfunding yeah. stuff with startups. Go out there and put a few hundred here, a few thousand there that you can afford to lose, help you hit one, put your money back in your pocket, and then go have fun. Do your homework, know where you stand. Michael Fugler. Well, that will do it for us at Entrepreneur. To watch any part of our show or check out thousands of articles that will motivate you, go to entrepreneur.com. Thanks for watching. I had a, when I started writing these stories, I wrote them for myself. And um, as, the, as we all know, it started as Twilight fan fiction. They became so popular mm -hmm. that I got very concerned that someone would copy 
the idea so I thought well, I'll publish it and I came up with a pen name and I thought I'll continue doing my job in telly and this will happen and then you know it's just you know I'm now here doing this. Mm -hmm.